If you are overweight, obese, pre-diabetic, or have type 2 diabetes, this protocol is for you. Only 12.2% of American adults are now metabolically healthy. 86 million adults in the U.S. have pre-diabetes, and 70% of these individuals will eventually develop diabetes. Being overweight or obese is the main factor for progression to diabetes. The best way to reverse diabetes is to not get diabetes in the first place, because your chances of heart disease, cancer, and death are increased even as a pre-diabetic. Our protocol offers real hope and transformational change to patients who would otherwise be consigned to a lifetime of medications doctor's visits, and suffering. Welcome to ReverseDiabetes.md. Hi, I'm Dr. Kapreet Pata. I'm a board-certified anesthesiologist, interventional pain physician, and addiction specialist. Today, I'll be talking a little bit about one of our protocols that we utilize to help patients with obesity, prediabetes, and diabetes type 2. The purpose of today's discussion is why counting calories fails. And I'll go about discussing this by first describing what a calorie is and why it's not really that relevant when we talk about patients with prediabetes, diabetes, and obesity. I think it's really important for people to have an understanding of what food labeling is and why it really isn't very relevant and how confusing it really has become. There's a certain thing called a calorie, there's another thing called a nutritional calorie, and yet there's a whole different thing called a human calorie, or a calorie that we as humans consume. And I'm going to go through what these differences are, because I think it's really important for people to realize the discrepancy that we face. A calorie is literally a measure of how much energy is required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree centigrade. So when we talk about a calorie from the standpoint of physics, that's what the literal, de de literal definition is. The calorie you see on a food package though is not the same calorie. That's a kilocalorie. It's 1,000 calories. So it would be the equivalent of raising 1,000 grams one degree centigrade. So that's the difference. A calorie in physics is different than a calorie in nutrition. Um, and it's a measure of how much energy it takes to raise the temperature of something. The original method to determine calories in a given food was directly measured by the energy it produced. The food was placed into a sealed container. It was called a bomb calorimeter. And it was ignited. And the change in temperature was measured and that gave people the idea of what the nutritional content of that particular food was. But that's not a nutritional calorie. Calories in food and calories as measured by physics are not exactly the same. Nutritional calories exclude non-digestible components. So dietary fibers, artificial sweeteners, things that we can't burn from a biological standpoint but can be burned in a bomb calorimeter to generate heat are not included in nutritional calories. And many of these human non-digestible components like cellulose, which are the primary energy source for other species like ruminants, like cows, are things that we don't even count. Human calories are dependent upon the body's ability to catabolize them. They usually involve enzymatic actions and they involve systems that don't require extraordinarily high heat to liberate the calorie. So in a bomb calorimeter, you're using extraordinary heats to liberate those calories. In the human, we don't have that. We use enzymes to get those calories out. The food labeling system is not these nutritional calories are the energy available in food which our body can use for chemical reaction or that you can use to store as fat in glycogen or fat. We count the calorie value of that body can extract from the food consumed but we ignore the interaction of the food as a signaling molecule and we ignore the non-digestible components and we ignore the thermic energy consumed in breaking down food for consumption. So nearly 30 percent of the energy that you use to break down a steak is consumed 
in the consumption of that steak. So even though, for example, you would think that you're getting 750 calories in a steak, 250 calories of it went just to be able to utilize it. So the net calorie is only about 500. So even though it says 750, your net is only 500. So that thermic energy is very important as in terms of the total net gain of calories for the human being. So this gets pretty complicated. There's something called a calorie paradox. There occurs in a paradox in nutritional science where something that apparently has a high calorie consumption of one food causes weight gain while the same calorie consumption of another food causes weight loss. And that makes people say, well, calories don't count. But they do count. They just don't count in the way that we think they count. The laws of physics are not broken. Calories do matter with respect to total energy balance. A surplus of calories, whether it's fat, whether it's protein or carbohydrates, will all lead to weight gain. It's just the speed with which you'll gain weight, and it's all of the other factors, that the, the factors associated with hormones, the factor associated with thermic energy, the, emic, the enzymatic processes, and all of the other processes that are also relevant. It's the quality of the calorie and what the body does with that specific nutrient, and whether that's a signaling molecule or whether it's just a direct caloric equivalent. The body is not static. It utilizes nutrients and extracts energy associated with those nutrients in a continuous way, and it interacts with the gut, the gut microbiome, the, the bacteria in the gut. And so how those gut bacteria interact it has a huge impact on how much energy is actually extracted from a particular food. It really depends on the specific approach of the calorie, what the specific individual is, and in what specific time. One group of calories consumed in the morning has a different result than the same group of calories consumed at the end of the day based upon what the cortisol hormones are doing. One group of calories consumed in fat has a different outcome than the same number of calories consumed in protein or consumed in carbohydrate. The real issue in obesity and type 2 diabetes management is how the bodily body utilizes the nutrients presented if that specific approach works for that specific individual in that specific time. Food is both a nutrient and a programmer content. Food should be viewed as a nutrient, so it's obviously translated as calories, but also as a set of instructions to the body, a program directing the body to a specific action. Food is not completely degraded to its elemental parts during digestion. It maintains integrity, and which then goes on to program the cells. And if it programs the cells in a way that's corrupted, it leads to an outcome such as obesity, diabetes, autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, a whole host of other problems can occur because of the programming of a particular food, not just the nutritional content of the food. These instructions are not interpreted just by the body, but they're interpreted by the gut microbiome, the bacteria in the gut. And that itself has a whole bunch of other subroutines which affect the body. It affects the nervous system, it affects the hormonal system, it affects heart rate variability, it affects sympathetic tone, it affects meta metabolism. Nearly a third of all carbohydrates are actually fermented in the gut by, mi by gut microbiome bacteria. And the level of fermentation decides what caloric consumption the patient ends up getting because the gut microbacteria process that stuff first. Most conventional nutritional advice completely ignores the instructional programming code carried by the food that we consume. And it's probably because it's super, super complicated. These instructional programs from food should not be ignored. They cannot be ignored. They're the reason why some people are skinny and some people are not. They're the reason why some people get diabetes and some people don't. Focusing on feeling deprived by caloric restriction doesn't help. It only makes that thing more desirable. It's easier to track the fact of not eating sugars and artificial sugars than actually counting their calories. 
if you start counting the calories of what you're actually eating, it makes you feel deprived. You basically relive it. And as you relive it, your stomach releases ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. And it makes you hungry. It makes you eat. Instead of calories, we recommend that people focus on real food. It's easier to track the amount of steak, the amount of fish, the amount of shrimp, the poundage of chicken that you're eating, rather than the exact calories. It's not what you didn't eat, it's what you did eat, and who you are that matters. You are the person that doesn't eat sugars, so you want to avoid those sugars. You don't want to fall prey to big processed food manufacturers because they encourage hyperconsumption. And you know the truth about vegetable oil. And we're going to go through all that in a few seconds. We want people to focus on their feeding window. We want them to restrict the time that they're eating rather than necessarily what they're eating by caloric content. It's easier to track the number of hours that somebody's eating than it is to count the exact number of calories. What we want to do is get people to eat down to less than eight hours a day and then eventually one hour a week reduce, get down to six. And if they can get down to five or four, that's even better. What this does effectively is reduces the insulin load, which then reduces insulin resistance and reduces fat storage and makes the human body healthier. A calorie is a calorie only if it's incinerated in a bomb calorimeter and the heat given off is measured. Biologically derived calories from different foods have different purposes, different metabolic effects, and different end results. Equal calorie portions of sugar, alcohol, meat, or olive oil have different effects on the hormonal system. They have different effects on satiety. They have different effects on cholecystokinin, on peptide YY, on leptin, on ghrelin. It's relevant only that it's food, but it's irrelevant how many calories a portion of food on a plate contains. It's the neurohormonal effect from those calories that makes the difference. What matters is how our body responds to the ingestion and absorption of those calories, how they're metabolized, and the resulting level of satiety. Satiety is the key element of how much you're actually going to consume. You can consume two to 300 calories of one food that's carbohydrate and not be very satiated and eat again in an hour or two and consume 600 calories of something that's fattier and not want to eat for the next eight or 10 hours. So it makes a huge difference. Satiety and refeeding is the key to obesity, diabetes, and prediabetes. The current caloric reduction strategy, which promotes weight loss by reducing calories, encourages the use of lower calorie per gram food. So it encourages the use of carbohydrates over fats. And carbohydrates are not very satiating, and that causes a problem. And if we use the standard calorie reduction approach, only one patient in 167 actually is able to maintain weight loss, which generates a, rate, a failure rate of greater than 99% on obesity management using the conventional approach of reducing calories. It's wrongly assumed that excessive calorie intake, caloric intake is the root cause of obesity. A calorie of food energy has different metabolic fates based upon hormonal stimulation. So you really can't assume that a calorie is a calorie, even though a calorie is a calorie. It's what your body does with the calorie. The primary driver is the hormone insulin. Insulin, which is a fat storage hormone and a growth hormone, determine what ends up happening with the food that you consume. The higher your insulin level is, the more fat you store. The lower your insulin level is, the less fat you store. The fewer hours that you have high insulin, the less fat you store. The more hours you have high insulin, the more fat you store. Because people rely on caloric content and they rely on these food labels, there's an implicit bias against fat because fat is nine calories per gram versus carbohydrates, which is four calories per gram. It ends up creating a simplistic focus and the dietary guidelines end up supporting a 55% carbohydrate load because it, it has less calorie density. But the problem is it may have less calorie density, but what do those calories do to satiety? And since 1977, since the change in 
guidelines encouraging the increased use of carbohydrate, we've noticed a significant uptick in obesity. It's our hope that shifting away from the focus of calories and emphasizing a healthy dietary pattern will change the food quality that patients consume and reduce obesity. Snacking makes you fat because it increases the frequency of insulin release. The more frequently you dump insulin, the more you're going to have a retention of fat in your liver and the more insulin resistant you're going to get. If you eat breakfast, you're going to automatically add a couple hundred calories per day and that's a very significant issue for most patients. Tracking calories to determine that you are eating less is complete self-deception. Even if you were completely meticulously tracking calories, if you looked at the food labels, you would be between 20 to 50 percent off. It's a coin toss. Would you be accurate or inaccurate? And the other bigger issue is that when people work out, eat less, move more, they look at their workout equipment and it says, oh, I burned this number of calories. And then they reward themselves with a snack. And that's a horrible idea because they just got the glycogen out of their liver. They just got some fat out of their liver and immediately they're going to replace it. And that doesn't benefit patients. And even if you were perfect at tracking the actual calories, your calculations would not account for the bioavailability of the nutrients, the anti-nutrients from vegetables, and the thermic effect of food. Your resting metabolic caloric requirement changes based upon circadian rhythm, day-to-day, hour-to-hour, season-to-season, and your gut microbiome changes nearly continuously. And it's the interaction between your central nervous system and your enteric nervous system, which is in your gut, that determines a whole host of basal metabolic rate functions. So this is probably way too complicated to look at a food label and say, oh, this is going to be 250 calories for me, and 9,000 calories equals a pound of weight, and I'm going to do this to get rid of a weight this weight. It's not that simple. We recommend instead of calorie counting, practice harahachibu. It's a Confucian or Japanese instruction that says don't overeat. Eat until you're about eight parts full, 80% full. This simple change will improve your joy of food. Eat slower. Focus on the food. Turn off the distractions. If you're going to eat, eat and just eat. Use smaller plates, smaller glasses. Focus on the food and recognize as you eat it when you're starting to get full. Does the first bite taste as good as the 10th bite? Does it taste as good as the 15th? And when it doesn't taste as good, when it doesn't provide that tremendous flavor advantage to you anymore, then it's probably time to put down the fork. Now the problem is that processed food companies will confuse you and they will change the flavor profile of their food so that the 10th and the 15th and the 50th and the 70th have a slightly different flavor which confuses your brain and confuses your palate and you keep eating because of the novelty of the difference in food in the same package. We recommend that people cut out all snacks. Snacks do nothing but release insulin and it's just an extra way to get a bunch of extra calories. Breakfast is probably the most important meal of the day if you're a big food manufacturer. Because if you end up eating breakfast, I guarantee you, you're going to eat about an extra 300 calories a day and you're going to get hungry again in about two hours because most people eat cereal for breakfast, which is carbohydrate. Breakfast came about because of Kellogg's cereal company. Harvey Kellogg was a deeply religious Seventh-day Adventist and he ran insane asylums and he was concerned that people were masturbating and he thought well maybe if we had them eat cereal it would stop them from masturbating and literally that was that was the rational basis and he might have been half right because as you develop insulin resistance you get worsening impotence in men because the nitric oxide goes out goes down and they become diabetic but we recommend you cut out all breakfast unless it's the one of two meals of your day If it falls inside your eating window, it's probably okay, but eating breakfast basically gives you an extra 350 calories for not much reason. We recommend that you eliminate all vegetable oil. 
linoleic acid or omega th omega six polyunsaturated fatty acid is already oxidized and it's incredibly damaging and it pre damages the liver and pre exposes patients to damage that will lead to metabolic syndrome. It's a hyperinflammatory state and frequently it's hidden in processed food. Eat real eat real fat. Real fat is more flavorful and it carries fat soluble vitamins and it's far better for you. The bottom line, if you're going to eat eat real food and your willpower is better spent elsewhere than calorie counting and calorie restriction. What you're trying to do is retrain your body to know when it's actually full. So eat slower. Recognize those signals that your body's getting. If you wolf down your food, you're going to miss those signals and overeat. Eliminate breakfast and restrict food to a six to eight hour window of a period of time. Get rid of the artificial flavorings and the artificial refined sugars and the refined foods. These have an artificially high glycemic index. They're acellular carbohydrates and they make you overconsume. Healthy fat makes you full. Unhealthy fat makes you hungry and it's toxic to your liver. Satiety, this feeling of fullness, is the key element in making sure that you don't overeat. And satiety with nutrient dense food is the most important thing that you can do. It's, what, it's not what you didn't eat, it's what you did eat and who you are that matters. It's more about how your body responded to the food that you did eat. You should reframe who you are. You're a person who doesn't eat sugar, artificial or natural. You don't fall prey to the big processed food manufacturers. You don't eat processed food, you don't eat breakfast, and you know the truth about vegetable oil. You don't eat vegetable oil. You want to eliminate that out of your diet. This has been Dr. Pata with ReverseDiabetes.md. Remember, the information discussed should not be considered specific medical advice and does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. This field is extremely complex and requires a direct physician and patient interaction. Each patient is medically unique and the exact protocol will need to be tailored. If you need further assistance, call our office at 314-481-5000 or send us an email to info at reversediabetes.md.